Okay, welcome back. This will be the last lecture of the course. And in this lecture, we're going to be uh, taking a closer look at the uh, biconnectivity issue, which we were looking at last time. And in, in this case, what we will be doing is um, basically going over the biconnectivity algorithm, but this time it'll be efficient. So you may remember, last time we had the following graph. We had here uh, the graph A, neighbors were B, C, and D. And D was connected to B and C as well. Um, we had E and F as other neighbors of D. They were connected, and also F to G, E to H, G to H, and G to I. So that was the graph we were dealing with last time. And so we said one way to work on the biconnectivity issue um, to try and figure out whether the graph was biconnected was to look for these cut vertices. Because if you had any cut vertex in the graph, if you had an articulation point in the graph, if there was some vertex that could be removed and therefore disconnect the graph, then you didn't have a biconnected graph by definition. So we said you could do a depth first traversal. And you could say, or depth first search, and you could say we'll go from D, and from D we go to A, and from A we go to B, and there's no more unmarked neighbors, so you back up to A and go to C, and there's no more unmarked neighbors, back up to A, back up to D, and we've done this before, so I'll just sort of finish it off. Um, H, G, I, and F. So there would have been a depth first spanning tree, and because it had two children, therefore there was no... Um, there was no, um, uh, or I'm sorry, because there had, the root had two children, we had a uh, cut vertex at the root. And we said in it, uh, vertices that were not cut vertices, if you started there and began traversal, for example, if we start here at E, if we were to first go to um, F and then to G and then to I, you back up to I, back to G, go to H, there's no more unmarked vertices, back up to G, back up to F, and then from there we can go to D, and to A, and to B, and to C, from A. So that was an example then of a depth first uh, uh, spanning tree where we did not um, have a cut vertex at the root. The idea was because I could reach everything from my first child of the root, that meant everything was connected to the first child of the root without going through E. So if E was removed, you still had this spanning tree at le illustrating at least one way in which all the other vertices would still be connected. Where here, if D is removed, the fact that we had to do the second traversal meant that there was no, no way to uh, reach A, B, and C from E, H, G, F, or I without going through D. So D was a cut vertex. And so the problem with this was we said, go ahead and run this algorithm on every vertex in the graph one by one, and we get a bunch of, of traversals. And then the trees with roots that had two or more children would be uh, cut vertices, and the uh, roots of trees where the root only had one child, they were not. And that took a long time, V times V plus E time. Now you might notice here, you might say, well, you know, you could have made this more efficient. From D, I traversed the tree a, B, and C, and that's all fine and good. The problem, let me make this B a bit clearer. So from D we traversed, and then we said, well, I took all this time traversing the entire tree, E, H, G, I, and F. When in reality, as soon as I saw that E was a second child of D, I didn't really need to explore the entire tree here. I could have just stopped with E. And I said, well, I don't really care about the depth for a spanning tree. I'm trying to determine here if the root has two children. And so as soon as I see the vertex E as unmarked, and I can go there from D, at that point I know D has two children, and I could stop. And you're right, you could, if that's what you were thinking. But that won't always be the case. So we're not going to rely on getting savings by saying, well, you know, I wouldn't have needed to traverse over that whole tree. Let me erase this tree rooted at E by basically putting up a slide that has the exact same thing. And what I'm going to do then is let's start a traversal at G to compare. And if I do a traversal at G, I can say, well, let me go to F. And from F, I can go to E. And from E, I can go to H. There's no more unmarked neighbors from H, so I back up to D. 
And there's then, I can go from D to A, and from A to B, and from A to C. But then there's no more unmarked neighbors from C or from A. From D, I have no more unmarked neighbors. From E, I have no more unmarked neighbors, neither from F. I have to go all the way back up to G, and then I just look for the second child here. So I've got here nine vertices, and I have the root, of course, and then seven of them in the one tree, and only one of them in the second tree. So in this case, relying on the fact that, hey, I could get more efficient time by stopping the traversal of the second tree once I found the root, because all I really need to do is know that there's a second subtree of the root, and that's all I need. So I see I, I stop. But in this case, I was all there was to do anyway. So we still did the entire depth first traversal. We just stopped at I. You know, so yes, in a case like this, there's savings to be gained from stopping the minute you see a second child. But in a case like this, there may not be. And so you can't reliably say you know, that there'll be one structure or another to traverse over, depending on the graph. So we're not going to really go for savings like that. I mean, we could have coded them into the brute force algorithm we talked about last time. But because we can have situations like this, we're not going to uh, base an algorithm on trying to stop early and saying, oh, that'll be great, because there's still, we still may have gone over a huge number of vertices here. And, uh, and so there's, there's no uh, reliable, sure gains to be made by stopping early on the second traversal, because there may not be much for the second traversal. However, there is a reliable gain to be made if we were to just do one traversal and make some information uh, detection off of there. That is, instead of running a new depth first traversal, new depth first search, uh, creating a new depth first search spanning tree on every single node as a starting point, let's just do the one. Let's do this tree. It starts at D. We could have picked any node, but let's start at D because that's the one we've been talking about. And let's say, well, okay, I know the root is a cut vertex. Now, is there anything we can say, anything we can learn from this tree that tells us anything about whether the other vertices are, are cut vertices? Because if we inspect these vertices as we do this depth first search or this depth first traversal, then once we're done with that tree, we'd be done completely. So let's just traverse the graph once and in the process learn not just whether the root is a cut vertex, but whether any of the other vertices are cut vertices as well. That way we're not chewing through all this other work traversing the graph over and over and over again only to learn about one vertex. Let's make use of all this other traversal information we did, whether just a little bit of A, B, and C here, or if we were doing something like starting at G, we have the whole monolithic tree here as the left subtree of G. Let's, make, let's take advantage of all that traversal we did instead of saying, well, I'm going to traverse all over these nodes just to see if any of them are connected to I. Let's say I traversed over all these nodes. Let's learn something about them while I'm traversing them. And that maybe means I don't need to do another tree starting at E and another, another tree starting at B and another tree starting at A. And in fact, it will mean that I don't have to do that. If I can take advantage of this fact that I had to do this traversal and say, don't just worry about whether we can reach the other vertices. Let's actually figure out whether these are cut vertices as we go. Then uh, that means I only do one depth first uh, search. And that will then cut down the running time of the algorithm significantly. We will have a greater constant on all this. You know, if we're not just traversing and popping back up, or if we're traversing and doing some calculations, we'll have uh, some work being done in perhaps the pre-visit or the post-visit part of depth first search. Remember the idea of the pre-visit was do some stuff on the vertex before inspecting the neighbors, and the post-visit was after you inspect some neighbors, do some stuff on the vertex. And so there's those two things. We'll be doing, you know, could do some pre-visit work and or some post-visit work. And if you have some stuff to do there, then yeah, the running time will take a little bit longer. But we say as long as the work being done there is constant time, the whole thing is still V plus E. It would just be V plus E with a larger constant because we're spending a little bit more time at each vertex. And that's ultimately what we'll end up with here, is that we'll spend a little bit more time doing some calculations at each vertex, um, but overall it will still be V plus E time, which will be not much nicer than V times V plus E time. So that said, the question here, let me, before I replace this, what we're going to do is once again, I'm going to sort of erase this tree by putting up a new slide that has that spot blank. Um, and uh, so let me go ahead and do that. I finally figured out how to erase on these papers. I just redraw the same slide in advance. <laughs> so we, uh, 
ask ourselves, OK, I can easily tell whether the root is a cut vertex in this tree because I know that, well, it's got two children. How do we go about telling if another vertex is a cut vertex? And let's consider H for the moment first. What would happen if we removed H from the graph and therefore from the tree? So let's take the spanning tree we just made, or this one with D here, but let's remove H and ask ourselves what happens. So H here is gone, and I've got these, you know, I mean, these edges would be gone too, but I'm just sort of showing where it was. So H is sort of just ripped from the spanning tree here. And we have this problem now, which is how on earth do I get from G to the rest of the graph, the rest of the tree here? I'd like to be able to, I said, if I do this whole spanning tree, obviously everything's connected. Because I say, well, I can just, if you've got a spanning tree, then by definition, if it's an undirected graph, um, by definition, everything's connected. If I want to find a path from B to G, well, the spanning tree shows me. I can go up to the root and then down to G. So one nice thing about a spanning tree is once you've got a spanning tree, you do have at least one way to go between any two vertices because all the vertices are connected by the tree. So if I rip one out of the tree here, like I did for H, the question then becomes, how do I get from G to the ancestors of G? Because presumably, these vertices here are still connected to the root because we didn't touch that side of the tree. And all the ancestors of H, the, the vertex we ripped out of the tree, all the ancestors of H are still connected to the root of the tree. So I can freely go between the other subtrees and the root and the ancestors of H and the root. So that means they're all connected still, because I can just kind of go to the root and then go to them. And indeed, here, F and everything that's a descendant of G is still connected to G. Removing H didn't do that. What we have here is we have H, and it has one child, G, G can reach all of its descendants. The parent of H can reach all of its ancestors and therefore all the rest of the vertices in the tree. And the only question remains, how do I get from G to any of its ancestors, whether E or D or, you know, if you had 10 levels deep, you want to get to some ancestor of G. So that's the question here. How do I get from G to its ancestors? If I can't do that, if there's no longer any way to get from G to its ancestors, then in that case, H must have been a cut vertex. If, for example, the tree itself, if this was our graph, ignore the top graph for a moment, if this was our graph, and so when we do a depth first traversal, depth first search, we happen to traverse over exactly the graph. This was a graph that happened to be a tree. Then in that case, G here, if you remove H, that's it. It's, it's, you can't, everything's disconnected. And in fact, with the tree, if this was the graph itself, every vertex, um, I shouldn't say that, I take that back, but uh, H certainly would have been a cut vertex here. However, this wasn't our original graph. This was, which means we have other edges available to us. And in particular, let me draw in one that we have not yet made use of. In fact, I can draw in two we have not yet made use of. And let me darken these in, because again, I don't know how well it's going to show up. So I'll do what I did last time, and I'll make these skipped edges a little bit thicker. The book refers to them as skipped edges. Those are the edges that we did not need for the depth first search. We said here, well, when you inspect the neighbors of F, both of them, D and E, had already been marked, so we didn't add those edges to the spanning tree. But the nice thing here is, because I can go from F to E or from F to D, that means that, well, those are edges that are actually in the graph as well. So it's possible to go from G to E or from G to D or from G to anything else. Or more generally, the vertex that we removed, H, there's a way to go from its child to its ancestors. And that's our concern here. When I pull a vertex out of the tree, that vertex was connecting its parent to its children. And there's only one child here for H. So E was connected to G through H. If I remove G, I want to make sure, I'm sorry, if I remove H, I want to make sure that the child, G, is still connected to H's parent. 
because if it can reach his H's parent, then it could have reached everything else. So maybe it's connected to the parent directly. Um, maybe there was an edge from G to E. Maybe it's even better connected to some ancestor of the parent, such as if there had been an edge from G to D. Then I can just go from D to E, and that's, that's fine too. So I'm really concerned about saying, is G connected to any ancestor of H? So yeah, G connected to E directly bridges that gap. But if G had been connected to any ancestor, such as D, well, then we know that E is connected to D, so everything's OK. So we're really only concerned with saying G is connected to some ancestor of the removed node. It doesn't have to be the immediate parent. It could have been the grandparent of what we got rid of or further up, because any, any, um, any node that G is connected to on the path from H up to the root can then reach everything else. So we're OK there. So we want to ask ourselves, is the child of H, is there some way to connect the child of H to the ancestors of H, one of them anyway, without going through H itself? And we say, well, there's no edge from G to E, or G to D, so we don't have any connection to any of the ancestors of H directly. But I do have this whole subtree of G, and you know, removing G's parent doesn't disconnect G from its own children. So sitting at G, I could have gone to any of the children and if any of those children are connected to the ancestors, one of them, then we're OK. And in fact, F here has two connections to two different ancestors. But either of those edges would have worked. So if you even were missing one of those from the graph, you'd still be OK here as far as H goes. The point is that G, though itself not connected to any of H's ancestors, could go down to a descendant, in this case, G's child, but it could have been G's grandchild or G's great-great-grandchild or whatever start either at G or go down to some descendant of G, and then we want some edge that takes us upward above H to an ancestor. If we have that, we're OK. If we have some connection from G or its descendant to an ancestor of H, then we're all right. Or in other words, let me go ahead and write this out. I'll come back to that picture in a moment. A non-root vertex in the first spanning tree is not a cut vertex. Only if its children, and we only looked at a, a vertex of one child right now, but we'll look at it one with two children in a second, all have connections, I say somehow, to it's ancestors, somehow. So we're going to say a non-root vertex, um, a, some vertex like H, which is the one we got rid of, the only way it wouldn't be a cut vertex would be if all of its children had connections to the ancestors of H. And that's what we said here. It only has one child, so we say, all of its children have connections to its ancestors. What we want is, a little more specifically, for each child W, W or descendant of W must be adjacent to an ancestor of V. And I should really say here, proper ancestor. Um, remember, proper ancestor means any ancestor but the vertex itself. So when I say a proper ancestor of H, I mean all the nodes above H. You don't include H yourself. So. We're saying W or a descendant of W 
um, we could say proper descendant of W instead, because if you say a proper descendant of W, that means all the children or grandchildren or whatever. If you just say descendant of W, then that meant that could include W itself. But that we're not trying to exclude W, so that's fine. Um, but here we're trying to try to exclude H, uh, that vertex H. We're saying um, every child of H must be a, every for every child of H, that child or its descendants must be connected to some parent or grandparent or great grandparent of H. If that's not true, if at any point this is false, then the vertex in question is a cut vertex, an articulation point. So this is really what we're after here. This is sort of the more general description. This is the specific idea we're looking for. For every child W of your vertex V that you're trying to determine whether it's a cut vertex, that child W or its descendants must be adjacent or a descendant must be adjacent to a proper ancestor of V. And that's what we have here. This vertex V that we got rid of, we said it wasn't a cut vertex because here is its one child W, and W or one of its descendants is indeed connected to an ancest proper ancestor of V. In fact, it's connected to two different proper ancestors of V. So H was not a cut vertex. Now let's look at A, because A has two children, so we can look at a similar interesting case. Again, I'm going to erase this by putting up the original diagram. And I'll say, well, what about A? What if I got rid of A? And I said here, here's D. And here's B and C, but they're no longer connected because A is missing. And then we had here E, H, G, I, and F. And I say, well, is A a cut vertex? And again, the rule was A is not a cut vertex as long as every child, either that child or its descendants, have some connection to an ancestor of A. And here we're a little bit more limited, because when we got rid of H, the child had descendants. When we get rid of A, there's only their children. We don't have huge subtrees off of B or C. But that's okay. We're simply saying, well, now that we've gotten rid of A, we want to make sure every child of A some way can get to a vertex above A. So either B is connected, and we see we don't have a huge amount of ancestors of A either. For H, we had the immediate child or its descendants, and for H we had two different ancestors. Here we have much less room to work with. We don't have the option of saying we could have connected the child to the immediate ancestor, or the child to a far higher ancestor, or a descendant to the immediate ancestor, or the descendant to the far higher ancestor. We had four possibilities there. Here there's only one possibility. We have a child but no descendants. We have an immediate parent but no higher ancestors. So the only way to get this property to work, the only way to, to make this to work out is to say, if I get rid of A, I want my child to be connected to A's parent. Because the general, the general, what we're looking for is the child or its descendant, one of its descendants, has to be connected to one of the ancestors of A, one of the proper ancestors. A has only one proper ancestor, its parent, the root. And there are no descendants of B, so the only possibility to connect to that is B itself. But we're okay, because we did indeed have a skipped edge that we left out. B was connected to D, and likewise C was connected to D. So A is not a cut vertex. Because for both children of A, the child or one of its descendants, in this case it's actually the child we're talking about and not one of its descendants because there aren't any descendants, the child or one of its descendants is adjacent to one of the proper ancestors of A. And there's only one proper ancestor of A, so we have to be adjacent to that, and indeed we are. So once again, we were okay removing A, because all of its children satisfied that condition, that the child or one of its descendants must be connected to one of the ancestors of the, the vertex V that we're examining, which is A. And so note that if I didn't have that edge from C to D, then I wouldn't satisfy that property. And you can see that here, if you remove the edge from C to D, then the only way C is connected to the graph is through A. And if you get rid of A, then C would no longer be um, connected to the rest of the graph. And actually, we can see that if we inspect G, if we again erase that picture, and I have, um, I want to get rid of G, I say, well, this time it will be a cut vertex. 
if I have here A, B, and C, and I have here E and H, and that now we have here I and F, then what we're saying here is, well, G is missing. G was, a, was, G was not a cut vertex, only if all the children had other ways to get to the ancestor. And as we've already seen, F did have other ways to get to the ancestor. You could go from F to E or from F to D. So you had those two skipped edges that you could have taken, and so F did have the means to get to ancestors of G. But I does not. There are no other edges from I other than the one to G, and so we said, well, G is, a, is saved from being a cut vertex. It's not a cut vertex, only if all the children have this ability. One of them does. So F is still connected to the graph if you remove D, G, but if you remove G, I has no other way to get to the ancestors. So it's not good enough to say, hey, one of them is fine. We want to make sure all the vertices that G had as children are okay, are still connected. Because the way we originally did things was those, our original spanning tree that we're saying, aha, everything's clearly connected because, you know, we have a spanning tree. But I and F were getting to everything else through G. So we say, well, if G was removed, can I and F still be connected? We can't say, well, yeah, we found a connection before because now the removal of G has killed that connection. So what this whole process is, is looking for a backup connection, basically. And we say every child needs a backup connection because every child got to the ancestors of G by going through G. I would have joined to H through G. F would have joined to H through G. So with G gone, the question is, can I still reach H and can F still reach H with, with the prior method gone? And with G gone, F can still reach H by going to one of its ancestors and then going downward. But I cannot. And so as a result, uh, G is a cut vertex because our condition is not kept. Um, we have one of the two children able to reach the ancestors, but not both children, not all of the children. And if even one child has no auxiliary backup path to the ancestors, somehow, either from the child directly or from the descendants of I to the ancestors of G, if there had been any descendants of I, since no such path exists, I cannot get connected to the ancestors of G. The only way that I could have done that would be, um, would be if we had um, G available that I could go through G. And we don't, because we're proposing to remove it. So therefore, G is a cut vertex. And so that's what we're looking for, is those kinds of things. Uh, we want to detect for uh, basically saying, we know a vertex is a cut vertex if, all of its, if any one of its children has no path, no edge, either from itself or descendant, to one of the proper ancestors of our, our vertex we're examining. So that's the uh, secret here. And so when we do this, the question is, how can we do this algorithmically? And the answer is, We can use depth calculations. Pardon me one moment. Okay, sorry, I'm back. The, uh, there was some noise back in the video room. I thought someone needed a tape and I needed to get kicked out of here. Um, so, uh, we'll finish this up and we'll be done. Um, sorry for the delay. So, that said, um, we now have this tree, this is the tree we've been dealing with, and if you note, let's examine if I was to write the depths on all of these. Well, what we're really saying then is, I want, and I'm going to go ahead now and draw in those, those um, in dotted line form. Whoops, this is supposed to be E. In dotted line form, I want to draw in the uh, skipped edges that we didn't actually didn't need to draw in the tree. We have that, and we have that as a skipped edge, and we have that as a skipped edge. So those four edges were the skipped edges. And what we're saying now, 
is that our goal is to make sure that we can reach from a descendant, from a child or its descendants, a higher, or I'm sorry, a lower depth vertex. That is to say, when we're examining if H is a cut vertex, what we are saying is, well, I have a child G. Can G, either directly from itself or from a descendant, reach a proper ancestor of H? And the proper ancestors of H all have a lower depth than H. H is depth 2. Its parent would be less than that, obviously, in terms of depth. Its grandparent would be less than that. We can see E's depth is 1, D's depth is 0. We inspected A, and we said A had only one ancestor. That one ancestor is less than A in depth. And when we're concerned if G is a cut vertex, G had three ancestors, all of which were less than G in depth. So when we talk about reaching an ancestor of the vertex we're inspecting, we're saying, can we reach a vertex that has a lower depth than the vertex we're inspecting? If we're asking if G is a cut vertex, we're saying, can you reach something of depth 2, 1, or 0? Because G's depth is 3. And when we inspect the children, we're saying, well, I have a child or an ancestor of that. I need an edge back up to a, a um, vertex of lower depth. So when asking, is H a cut vertex, we're saying, can my child G, is there any connection from the subtree rooted at that child to a vertex of depth 1 or 0? So in terms of numerical terms, that's what we're asking. When we say, is the child or one of its descendants um, attached to a an proper ancestor of H, we're saying, H's depth is 2. Is my child or one of its descendants connected with an edge to something of depth less than 2? And so the way we might figure that out is to say, well, what's the lowest depth we can reach from each vertex? And I can note here, well, the lowest depth I can reach from F is 0, because I have a connection from F to 0. It's, of course, F is, depth, F is depth 4 itself, but I do have a connection to an edge of depth 0. Could I, so I could say, well, I have that ability. The lowest uh, connection I have is to a vertex of depth 3, namely its parent, G. And if you know what the lowest reachable depth is of your descendants, you can take that into account yourself because you can reach your descendants. So G can say, well, my own depth is 3, so I know at, at worst I can reach a depth 3. In fact, I could reach depth 2 because I have my parent, of course. But we can also say, well, what's the lowest depth I can reach if I was to say, let me go to my child and inspect that. Well, I can reach depth 3. So G says, well, that's no better than me. But F, F can reach depth 0. So G says, well, I can say it myself, or I can go to I, and in each case, you know, I can't really reach any better than 3. But if I were to go to F, there is an edge there up to a vertex of depth 0. So that means it is possible a descendant, G or its descendant, the subtree rooted at G instead of the subtree, here we say, in a sense, the subtree rooted at F has some edge to a vertex of depth 0. Now we're saying the subtree rooted at G has some connection to a vertex uh, of depth 0. G itself doesn't, but we said compare the actual depth of G to all of its neighbors' reachable depths. And we say, well, I can reach 3, F can reach 0. So I can always go to one of my neighbors, one of my, one of my children. And so from G, I can say, well, if I was to go to my child that can reach depth 0, then I can reach depth 0 myself. So we're saying, I've inspected my children. I found what depth they can reach. And since I can go to my children, I can reach the same depths they can reach. So if I was to I recursively inspect all of my children as deeply as they can go, find out what depths are reachable from those children, and then I can say, well, since I'm able to go to my child, I can easily reach the same depth my child can. Because if F can reach 0, G can go to F and then go to 0 from there.
So we can basically say that the reachable depth of any vertex is its own depth, the minimum, I should say, the minimum of its own depth and the reachable depth of all its children. Because from any vertex, you can go to one of the children and then follow its own reachable depth path. And likewise with H. H could re reach depth zero because H says, well, I have a child that can reach depth zero, namely G, and I can always go to G. There's nothing keeping H going from H to G and then from G saying, however that zero was obtained, we've already calculated that zero could be obtained. It happened to be by going to F and then following the F to D edge. But we say, I don't really care about those details. I just know G is claiming, hey, I can reach depth zero by traversing to some descendant and then going up to some ancestor. So H says, well, since I can go to you, I can go to zero as well. And E likewise says, well, heck, I can go to H, and H is claiming that if you, that some it or, I should say, E says, well, my child H claims that at the, tr the tree rooted at it, the tree rooted at H, has some connection to a depth zero vertex. And since I can go to H, and H is claiming that connection, I, E, have a connection to that depth zero vertex as well. Because E could go to H and then follow whatever path H is claiming it has to a depth zero vertex. So that's how this can work. We could recursively, once we have the depths, calculate that. We can say at each vertex, well, this kind of thing works out. At each vertex, we say, my children have inspected you know, their own subtrees and said what vertices they can reach, what depths they can reach. And so by going to my child, the one with the lowest reachable depth, I can then follow the path it's claiming it has and go to that low depth. So there, therefore, if F is claiming it can, it can read zero, then G can read zero as well. And if G is claiming it can read zero, then H could read zero. And if H is claiming it can read zero, then E can read zero, and, and so on. And so then what we're saying is, this is our, our, our magic condition, when we talk about the reachable depth, we say, if I have a child, such as G has a child I, whose low, lowest reachable depth is not less than my own depth, then I'm a cut vertex. G says, my depth is three. I have a child, I have one child, F, that can reach way above me, so that's fine. F's reachable depth is less than G's actual depth. But I's reachable depth, which is three, is not less than G's actual depth. So what we're saying here is G is saying, I have a child I who cannot reach any higher than me without going through me. But basically, F, G says, I have this child F, and it was able to reach way up in the tree without going through me. But I have this other child I, and it was not able to reach any higher than me. That's depth three, I'm depth three. So therefore, if I was gone, I, I'm sorry, if G was gone, then I would be disconnected. Whereas with H, H says, I have a child, it's got a reachable depth of zero, and my own depth is two. So H here says, I have a child for which that child or one of its descendants has a connection back up to H's ancestors. So H is not a cut vertex. G, or H, then that's the only child H has, so it's okay. For all of H's children, they can reach a depth higher than H. But that's not true for G. For, if, we, if I was to say for all of G's children, they can reach a depth higher than G, that's false. Because one of G's children, I, cannot reach a depth higher up in the tree. I should say lower number, um, uh, higher up in the tree, but a lower depth. One of G's children cannot reach above G in the tree, cannot reach a lower depth than G. So our condition is not kept. The condition is all the children have to be able to reach depths lower than your vertex. And G has a child whose depth, reachable depth, is not lower than G's depth. And so that's our detection. That's what we want to worry about. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, as we build the tree, figure out the depths. And then as we return from the recursive calls, figure out these um, low values. That is the... Um, the goal here is to do a pre-visit and a post-visit. We will give a vertex a depth before inspecting its neighbors, and then after we've inspected the neighbors, we then know what their reachable vertices are, and we can assign our reachable depths, and we can assign our own reachable depth from that. So let's start by, and we'll come back to that diagram, 
let's start by remembering the depth first search algorithm. And I can say we have the depth first search wrapper on some vertex G. And I can say um, for, for all vertices V and G, V dot uh, mark or V dot encountered was equal to false. And then I can say um, root equals some vertex, whichever one. We said uh, the old depth first search wrapper said for all vertices, if it, you know, you call depth first search off of it, we're just saying pick some vertex as your starting point. Uh, so that's similar to saying when we said for all vertices V and G, we're saying, well, you have to start at one of them and then pick the second one and pick the third. Here we're only saying pick the first vertex and then call depth first search on the root. The assumption we're making here is that, and then of course, the rest of depth first search said, well, given depth first search on some vertex, we say that V dot mark is equal to true. And then we say for all neighbors W of V, if W dot mark is false, depth first search on W. So that was our depth first search algorithm. And you may remember we had originally a little bit more complicated stuff there. We said, well, we might have to start over. So we have this whole for loop where we said, for all vertices V, if V isn't marked, then call depth first search on V. And we explained that was so that we had the ability to build a depth first forest if we needed to by if, we, if our first depth first search didn't mark all the vertices, we'd start again. But we're assuming here we have a connected undirected graph, which means we don't need to worry about it. If the graph is undirected and if it's connected at least once, may not be biconnected, but if it's connected, then from the root we can reach everything. And we've been seeing that in our diagrams. We didn't draw any, any forest. We only always had just the one tree. So there's no need to start over. If the graph is going to be undirected and at least connected one way, then that means one tree will be all you need, so you don't need the start over code. So in that case, you don't say for all vertices called depth first search if it's unmarked. You simply say, we mark them all false, and then you pick some starting vertex and call depth first search on that, and that will be enough. There's no need to loop this procedure and start over if there's still some unmarked vertices, because there won't be any unmarked vertices. Everything's reachable from the root. If we had a disconnected graph or a directed graph, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. So this is a slight simplification of what we did earlier. Now, the issue here is that if we're going to calculate depths instead, it's not enough just to mark things. We can say, well, when I enter the depth first search procedure, the first thing I do is mark the vertex true. If we instead said the first thing we do is mark the depth, well, how do we calculate the depth? The depth of a vertex is its depth of its parent plus one. And we have no parent access here. And in addition, the depth of the root is not the parent plus one. The depth of the root is just plain old zero, because that's where we start. And so if we want to sort of have a standard depth first search procedure, saying let's mark the vertex once we enter the recursive call doesn't really make any sense. Because we don't know what its parent is, and so we have no way to get the parent's depth so we can add one. And also, if v happened to be the root, then we wouldn't be able to use that procedure anyway, because you don't mark the root by saying, uh, parent's depth plus one, you just know the root's depth is zero. There is no parent. So if we're going to be concerned about a calculation here, instead of just simply marking it true, then the smarter thing to do is probably to do our marking beforehand instead of afterwards. That is, what we will do is, in this position here, now let me add this in green, in this line here between the root assignment and the depth first search call, we can say that root the root depth is equal to zero, which means here what we want is not to say the mark is false, but to say that the depth is some value that wouldn't be possible, which is negative one. So that's our signal. We say v dot depth is negative one. And that's our signal then that we're marking everything unmarked. We'll assign the root depth to zero before we make the recursive call. Therefore, we don't need this up here. And then we say, given this vertex that's sent into the recursive procedure already marked, we then say for all neighbors w, if the w mark is false, 
what we're really saying is, if it's still negative 1, then you'll make this call. But before that, you have to go ahead and insert the uh, depth addition as well. That is, let me rewrite this a little bit. Our new depth first wrapper, which we will call find cut vertices, passing the graph, we say for all vertices V and G, we say V dot depth is equal to negative 1. That's the equivalent of setting the mark fields to false. We set the depth fields to negative 1, so we know they haven't been reached. And so let me draw this here. That's the, uh, the old code and the, and the new one. And then we will say the root is going to be some vertex, whichever vertex happens to be the one you can pick for the root. You don't care which one. So just, you know, for our own graph class, for example, we'd say, um, that's why I'm underlining it. It's just very rough pseudocode. You call first vertex in your graph and you're done. And then you say, well, I'm going to always assign the depth to zero before I call. That way I enter DFS, always knowing what the depth is. And then when I inspect its neighbors, I can say, okay, well, I know V depth, and then as I inspect the neighbors, I'll give those neighbors depths. And that's a much more standard way of doing things. Whatever vertex you send in, its own depth plus one is a neighbor's depth as you inspect your neighbors. And that's much better than saying, when I send a vertex in, somehow find its parent, extract that depth, and then add one to it for my own vertex. Oh, but wait, if I'm the root that I passed in, then I don't have a parent. That's just very complicated. It's a lot easier to say, instead of having to mark the vertex with the depth when you pass it in, assume it's marked already, and then you can very easily mark its neighbors. And that's what we'll do then down here. For the um, depth first search part of this here, we can say, this is, we'll call this walk for cut vertices. There's our vertex, and we say here, um, for all neighbors W, V, if W dot depth is equal to negative 1, then we will do two things. We will say W depth is, e and that's what I was indicating here, W depth is equal to V depth plus 1, and we will also then call the depth for search, which is here walk for sort, or walk for cut vertices, on W. So that's what I did here. I said, well, we have to say this part has to be the, um, that the depth is negative 1 instead of the mark is false. And then in addition to the depth for search call, before that, I assign it a depth so that we know whatever I send in always has a depth already. And so that's our slight revision. If all we want to do is find the depths, this is what we have. This is a pre-visit concept here. W depth equals V dot, v dot depth plus 1. And we're saying before we call, um, before we uh, call on the, um, well, actually, it's not quite pre-visit, but we are sending, we're always making sure that a vertex has a depth before we call recursively on it. And that way, at the top of this, we don't need to assign it a depth because assigning it a depth once it's within the recursive call is a little bit more difficult than assigning it a depth before the recursive call. And that's what we see here. Otherwise, there would have been, an, as I said, a huge condition here to say, well, find V's parent so that V can be given the depth of its parent plus one. And that's just going to be much more complicated than saying this way, which is, as you look at the neighbors, I know my own depth. I don't know the depth of my parent, V, for example. Um, I don't know V's parent's depth, though I can figure it out. But I don't know what V's parent is. But I'd say, I don't need to know what V's parent is. V's depth is all I need, and V's already got a depth. And so I say, as I look at the neighbors of V, I assign their depths, rather than trying to find the parent of V and then assigning V's depth based on the parent. This is a slight rearrangement of our original depth for search code, which enables us to calculate depths instead of simply marking vertices as found. And so then, basically, what happens is then as we go ahead and do the graph, what we have here then is we'd say, well, I would find D, and then that's, or that's set to 0. Recursively call on D. I find one neighbor, which is A. I mark that 
neighbor as depth one and recursively call on A. I find a set, I find a neighbor of A, B. I mark that depth as A's depth plus one, which is two, and recursively call on B. B will have an edge to D, but D's already been marked. So forget about D and come back to B. And there are no other, or sorry, and then we have an edge to A from B, but A's already been marked, so we don't do anything there. We come back to B again. And now we've looked at all the neighbors of B. So we return A. A had another neighbor, C. Give that a depth and recursively call on C. And C had two neighbors, D, which was already marked, and A, which was already marked. So we don't do anything there. We return from C back to A. A had three neighbors, B, which we've already looked at, C, which we've already looked at, and D, which are, was already marked. So now we've looked at all the neighbors of A. We go back to D. D had five neighbors, A, which we just had called recursively on and returned. Now we would look at B, but B's already been marked. We could look at C, but C's already been marked. We could look at next E, mark that, that with depth one, and recursively call on E. And what we proceed to do there is then do the whole tree as we drew earlier. That would be mark two. That would be mark three, and we rec recursively call on that. That would be mark four. There's no unmarked neighbors. We return to G. That would be marked four. There's no unmarked neighbors. We return to G, blah, 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 blah. So as we find these, we'll mark their depths. And you can then look through the code and go through that again. Um, I know I went through that kind of fast, but I'm assuming here that, that, that the, uh, what I did wasn't too complicated. But this will mark the depths before making the recursive call to look at the neighbors. So given that, that part of the code will give us the depths. What we need then is when we're ready to return recursively, we then need to also send back a minimum uh, or de reachable depth. So what I want is to say, well, I want to always look at my neighbors and say, for example, from G, let's say, just for the moment, let's deal with this recursively and say that I and F can both say, hey, here's my value. So I, for example, can send back 3, and F, for example, can send back 0, as we looked at earlier. That was our earlier diagram. Let's say, for example, that I is able to return that value 3, and F is able to return that value 0. And we'll talk about how in a second. What G needs to do is it needs to say, when I recursively call on some vertex, I need that value. And when I recursively call on some vertex, I need that value. So we can put up the code we had originally, the code we were talking about, the, uh, the uh, walk, find for cut vertices and walk for cut vertices. Here's the code we just had up. And what we can say then is, when I recursively call on my child, I want that value back. And that's what we're sending here. When G says, for all of its neighbors, one by one, I look at neighbor I, I get that number back. So M would be 3. Or if I look at F, I get that number back. So F would be 0. And so what we then say here is, um, once we've got that, then we simply check and we say, if that value I got back, that's we, we kept saying, if the minimum reachable depth from our child is less than our own depth, then we're okay. So we can say here, if M is greater than or equal to the depth of V, and it turns out V is not equal to the root, then we know V is a cut vertex. And we're going to talk about this cut field in a moment. But we mark V as a cut vertex somehow. And that's what we're saying here. When from G I recursively call on I, I sends me back this minimum reachable value. If that is greater than or equal to my own depth, then I know I'm a cut vertex. So when I inspect F, I get a 0 back. That's not greater than or equal to 3, so that doesn't tell us G is a cut vertex. But when I recursively call an I and get this value back for M, that M is indeed greater than or equal to my own depth. So I am a cut vertex. And that's what we're saying here. If the minimum reachable depth of my child is greater than or equal to my own depth, and I'm at the root, then um, I am a cut vertex. And then in either case, we want G to be sort of gathering its own minimum depth. So we'll say here, 
to start out with, we say, well, what's the minimum depth reachable from G? And initially, that starts out as the depth of the vertex itself. So if V is the vertex G, we say min depth is 3. And I say, in this case, the minimum reachable depth is going to be the minimum of my own minimum reachable depth so far, what I found so far, and M. So I say here, what's the minimum reachable depth from G? Well, it's the minimum of its own depth and the minimum reachable depth of this one particular child. And then once we've saved that, in other cases, we would be saying something like, well, um, whoops, let me write an else here. Otherwise, the min depth is going to be equal to the minimum of Well, whatever min depth it's kept track of so far, and the depth of its neighbor. And you ask, what the heck is the purpose of that line? Well, that's for vertices like f, where we say f has a depth of 4, but it has a neighbor that's of depth 0. So f's minimum reachable depth is 0. Because this chunk of code only works for the descendants. We say if what I'm looking at has not been marked already, then I'm going to give it a depth, recursively call on it, and then get information back from that. So from G, we would say I has not been marked yet, so we do all this stuff on I and get back a value. And we say, well, again, F has not been marked, so I recursively go from G to F, get back information, and start messing with G. But if the vertex we call on had been F, well, in that case, F's neighbors are, are indeed marked. We say here F has three neighbors, G, E, and D. All of them are marked. None of them will hit that big if case. We then That's why we didn't add any descendants of F. When we say, if your neighbor is depth equal to negative 1, then you do all that garbage on, it, on the neighbor. Well, that's your descendants in the tree. But F has no descendants because all the neighbors it has were already in the tree when we reached F. So we're not adding any new descendants to F. We're simply saying, well, all of these will be ones where the depth is not negative 1. But at the very least, I want to say, well, my minimum reachable depth will be the minimum of myself and all of those. So I can reach a vertex of depth 3, a vertex of depth 1, a vertex of depth 0, and my own reachable depth is 4. That's my own depth. So the minimum of all those is what f can reach, and that indeed is 0. If there had not been the f to d edge, the minimum would have been 1, the edge to e. So we're basically saying, well, f says, I know I don't have any descendants in the tree, but I do have vertices I'm connected to. And, and so the question is, what's the minimum depth vertex I can reach? And the answer is 0 for the d. And so that's what's happening here. We're saying, well, even if I don't have any new descendants to add, I can at least calculate what's the minimum depth I can reach, which will be the minimum of whatever my current minimum is and this depth of this new vertex I found. And if, you know, as we say, well, for F, we have the neighbors G, D, and E. We'll say the minimum is going to be F's own depth, which is 4, and the depth of G, which is 3. So the current minimum is 3. And then we say, well, now we're looking at neighbor E, and so E's been marked, but S minimum depth is the current minimum it's holding, which was G's, which is 3, and the new neighbor's depth, E, which is 1. So the minimum of those is 1, and that's what we store away. And then we look at our third neighbor and say, well, F's third neighbor is D. That has already been marked, so we come down here and we say, we don't do anything new to D, but we at least say the minimum reachable depth of F is the minimum of the current value, which is 1, and the depth of, F, of D, which is 0. And so... We store zero here. And that's all the neighbors we have. And so when we're all done, we return the minimum depth. And so that's what we would do with f here. We would say, go ahead and inspect each of the neighbors in turn. When we're done, we will know the minimum reachable depth, because it'll be the minimum depths of those neighbors. And then we send that back up to G, and then G is the one that's saying, well, F was my descendant, so I do all this stuff. I say, if what F sends back is above me, then F can reach above me, and I'm okay. But if F is equal, if what F sends back is equal or below me, then I'm a cut vertex. And then either way, I can reach whatever depth it can reach. So I say, well, I've been keeping track of my own minimum depth, and if now my descendant can reach a lower minimum depth, then I'm going to restore that. And so that's why G starts out with depth 3, and then when we look at I's reachable depth, which is 3, we don't do any updates. And then we say, well, the current thing stored at G is 3, and when we look at F as a new descendant, we say, well, F can read 0, so therefore we want to save that, and G can read 0. And G will return 0 then 
back up to H. He says, well, I'm keeping track of my minimum. I start out, and that's what this initialization was up here, I start out saying my minimum depth is my own depth. So G says, well, right now it's 3. And then when I inspect I, I sends back 3, which is equal to 3, so there's no update. And F sends back 0, which is less than 3, so I'll store 0 and return that. And so basically we have, before the recursive call, we calculate the depth, and then we say each of my descendants sends back their minimum reachable value, and I collect all those, and the minimum of those and my, and my own depth I send back as my reachable value. And H says the minimum of my own depth and the reachable depths of my children is my own reachable depth. And E says the minimum of my own depth and the reachable depths of my children is my own reachable depth. And that just continues on and on. And so that's all there is to it. As we create the tree, we find the depths. As we return from the recursive calls, we send back these minimum reachable depths, and that allows our parent to calculate its own reachable depth from the reachable depths of its children. And then the only other thing to worry about is we say here, um, in addition to assigning the depth to be 1 for each vertex, we also need to say, well, each vertex starts out, we assume it's not a cut vertex until we indicate otherwise. And then, of course, there's the issue of the root as well, where we say, if root has two or more neighbors of depth one, then root, the root is a cut vertex. And we've already talked about that. So after you do all this stuff, because the roots can always reach itself, we always say, well, D's reachable depth is going to be equal to itself all the time. There is no parent above G. There are no ancestors for E or H or G to reach above D. So if D is removed, that would inherently make those not reachable. So instead we're saying, yeah, but if they're reachable from all this anyway, we're okay. So that's why that root was a special case. And so we handle that in the overall algorithm. And that's it. Um, that's the biconnectivity algorithm. That'll be V plus E time. And uh, that's all there is to say. So um, I will have a few more examples in the web because I don't have any notes for this yet, the little short note packets that I've been putting up. So I will type one up in a hurry, throw a few more examples in, but that's the gist of this. And I know this is complicated, but if you sit down carefully with the code and see what's going on, you'll be okay. And that's it. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, I know I things got behind a bit occasionally, and I do apologize for that. Um, but uh, I did the best I could for all of you. And uh, hopefully these lectures, videos have been useful to you. And uh, that uh, I guess I'll see you at the or I'll see your results when the finals come in. Uh, good luck to all of you on the final. And I'll be on the news group. So if you have questions, uh, keep posting away, and I'll keep answering. Uh, see you whenever. Uh, good luck. Take care.